this country is at war with Germany. With Germany. We shall go on to the end. I remember the sheets of flame which came up and almost blinded us from our guns. Borneo, the third largest island in the world, held immense strategic value during World War II and quickly became a top priority for Japanese control. With its vast reserves of oil and rubber, the island was essential for fueling the Japanese war effort. But Borneo would also become a tragic battleground, claiming the lives of countless prisoners of war, internees, locals and even Japanese forces. Joining me today is John Tullock. John has served with the Royal New Zealand Artillery before transferring to the British Royal Artillery, gaining experience across the globe and instructing on the British Army's Jungle Warfare course. He is also the author of The Borneo Graveyard, 1941-45, which tells the story of Borneo's occupation and the deployment and eventual capture of five Royal Artillery Air Defence Sections that were sent to South East Asia. John, thanks for joining me. Before we dive into the events of the war, it might be helpful to give listeners uh, a bit of background on Borneo itself. Um, I call it a country, but it's actually more complex than that, isn't it? It's divided between the British and the Dutch. Right, Bo- Borneo was several countries. The bottom part was Dutch Borneo, which is today's Kalimantan. And then you had Sarawak, which was, it was actually a private country. You then had Brunei, which was a British protectorate. And then you had uh, British North Borneo, which again was a funny sort of organisation. It was part British government, part chartered company. And then you had Labuan, which was again not a part of British North Borneo, but it stood by itself, but inevitably is taken in as part of British North Borneo. And then you have British Borneo, which is Sarawak, Brunei, Labuan, and British North Borneo. So it it is into the five countries. And the importance to the Japanese, it was a strategic imperative, was the oil. And just going round, you had the oil in Surya, which Brunei, in Miri, and Lutong, which was Sarawak. And then you had Tarakan. The oil produced in two of those oil wells was enough to support not just the Japanese homeland, but their war effort. Um, So oil was really very important. And then there's the hardwood, the teak type of wood, the ironwoods, which was important to their war effort. And thirdly, were the aerodromes, as they were called there, and the airstrips. And from Borneo, they were able to bomb Java, Singapore, and in fact, launch aerial attacks on Western Australia. But to Malaya command, Borneo was really not really very important. And so you had Sarawak, they sent the 2nd 15th Punjab Regiment, a company to go and destroy the oil wells up in Miri and Surya, which... Destroying oil wells is very difficult indeed. And then they had to, in essence, beat a hasty retreat back to Kuching, where the remainder of the battalion were. And the order was basically defence Sarawak with a battalion of 800-odd men. Brunei had nothing, no no force at all. And British North Borneo had, had three, not even territorial, they used to get dressed up in uniform and when visited by senior dig- dignitaries. The weapons they had were seriously out of date and they were ordered, an order came to them and said, you must not engage the Japanese, quietly surrender or otherwise things will go horribly wrong for you. You're not going to beat them. Was the expectation then that that, that Singapore would sort of somehow magically defend the whole area? Because I presume they... There was an understanding how strategic Borneo would be to the Japanese at, at the time of war. It just somehow seems vastly underdefended for something that would be so economically crucial to the Japanese war effort. I don't think they even thought about that. The Dutch did, in some format. They, they did. They had forces, and the Dutch East Indies land forces, either the K and the L, they were large. 
very big, very big indeed. They had air defence, artillery, coastal artillery, at the various at the various places. The soldiery, the other ranks, were on the whole Javanese, and they were not only just in Borneo; they were in Java, Sumatra, throughout these East Indies. They had a better idea, but but I think there there was with the Dutch and the British a sort of a conceit. These Japanese people don't know how to fight. The fighter pilots with their eyes, and of course the depiction was these round glasses, wasn't it? They said, how on earth can they, do they know how to fly, fly and fight in the air? Well, my word, they did. And of course the Japanese forces had been seriously blooded in China. And so the extremes that they carried out against the Chinese, which was pretty awful, and we just got to look at Nanking, what they did there. They hit hit uh, Malaya, and then they hurtled, just hurtled down the Malaya, and Singapore um, Singapore fell. And the second fifteenth Punjab, the CEO argued and said, "This is the only way that I can do anything to slow them up." And what it amounted to was Kuching was declared a free city. And the Punjab regiment retired to Bukit Staba, which was the airstrip come aerodrome. And that's where they fought on Christmas Eve in 41. 384 Japanese, 84, 83, 383, 84 Japanese were killed with over 1,100 wounded. They withdrew to reorganize themselves, and Colonel Lane, the commanding officer, said, right, this is the time where we we break contact. Half a company were left to give a false front, while the battalion started withdrawing. In front of them was a small group of Punjab that escorted the women and children of Raja Brooks regime and the wounded and the ill from the hospital, and they went down the track to Pontianak, and they made it, and amazingly there was an Allied vessel to take them off. Four days later, the Japanese arrived at Pontianak, but I have no idea what happened. I didn't sort of go down the rabbit hole to find out what happened there. And the Punjab Regiment then did this extraordinary fighting withdrawal from Christmas Day through 800 miles of Borneo jungle. And they eventually, they were given the choice. They arrived at an unpronounceable Dutch name, Palabo or something. I'm sorry. <laughs> to be greeted not by an Allied ship, vessel. They were greeted by Japanese Marines. And the two commanding officers met. And he said, the Japanese basically said, you've got two choices. One, to surrender, and we'll respect your surrender. Or two, you withdraw and you start fighting. Here is the order from uh, Tokyo. Anyone carries on fighting are treated as terrorists. And you will, if, when caught, you'll be executed. He went back and had a word with his officers and senior NCOs. He had lost half of his battalion on the way down. That caused a lot of casualties to the Japanese. They're out of ammunition. They're out of food. There was no way. And so he said, OK, we're surrendering. The Japanese Marines treated them with with respect. Yes, hard, but with respect. And it was only once they got into the prisoner of war camps, etc., where everything goes up and becomes seriously nasty. Did many on Borneo manage to escape? Did people see it coming and manage to flee? Or was it not really expected at all and it caught people on the hop? There were people that escaped. But a lot of the wives, the husbands were saying, look, you must go and said, no, you know, I'm a wife. I remain with you. And so they ended up as internees in, in Batu Lintang. So when, when the Japanese arrive, do they just take over the administration of the t- territory? How does they, how do they administer the occupation? What does that mean for the European civilians? Because I presume they don't leave them in post and then just put the, the Japanese put themselves above they intern everybody? Is that how it works? It varied. First of all, Borneo, British Borneo, and then you had at the bottom Dutch Borneo. 
British Borneo was run by the Japanese army, Imperial, and the southern part was run by the Japanese Navy and Marine. Neither part actually got on. You had the Kempai Tai on one side, which was army, and the you had the naval ones, which were actually worse. They were really, really absolutely awful. So when they landed between Miri and, and, and Surya, they captured Kuala Balait, where there's a residency there. They captured Labuan and the governor, the senior resident there. They said, right, you are to run Labuan for us. And said, no, I'm not. So they put him in a cage and paraded him for about three days. They charged him in court of all horrific sort of things. And so they ended up running it themselves with with local help. The resident, who was a very brave man, senior fellow, said to the lo- local people, the admin said, you must, as best of your conscience can, keep things going. Because these people have no idea how to administer. And that was actually very true, the Japanese. Their administration, their logistics, which in fact Bill Slim picked up very quickly indeed, was rubbish. Down in in British North Borneo, they remained sort of ish. And then then people came in and started running things but very much aware that the Kempo and Tai was always watching. That went on for a couple of months, and now away, you're off to Batu Lintang. And in essence, the same occurred in, in, in Kuching. But the administration in Borneo broke, broke down very, very, very quickly. There's a sizable Chinese population in Borneo, and certainly in the, in, in the, in the Indian part. In the British part, there's an Indian, a uh, significant Indian population how do the Japanese treat them? Because obviously the Japanese have been at war with China. Are they say are the Chinese seen as being the enemy? And the Indians, well, they're slightly more ambiguous. Yes, the Chi- Chinese were, to, were treated appallingly. Later on, as an example, and I'm now sort of jumping two or three years, 10th of May 1945 at Sandakan, they rounded up all the English-speaking locals, i.e. Chinese, and then executed them. And a couple of hours later, two American came by, came by and beat up Sandakan. And at Bahala Island, there was a Japanese suicide squadron. This is naval suicide squadron. Well, a couple of these boats were destroyed. The suicide squadron were furious. And the following day, they, they, they rushed across the water, which is only about 10 minutes in a fast boat, landed at Sandakan and ran amok. Man, woman, child, baby, didn't matter. And then they set places alight. The Chinese were given an exceptionally hard time. As an example, this is a personalised one-to-one talk I had, and she was my guide when I was doing the death march route. She spoke to me. She was one of 13 children, which is pretty good going. Her mother was a Kadazan, local. Her father was Chinese. And they ran ran a shop in Sandakan. And then the Japanese landed. What happened then? He was then, you're Chinese. And so he was locked up because she was considered contaminated. And that was the word. If you were married to a Chinese, didn't matter whether man or woman, the other person was contaminated. And she grabbed her first baby and with her sister disappeared off into the jungle. And there they remain to the end of the war, moving around, escaping Japanese patrols that were looking for people like that. Amazingly, they survived. And when the war ended, they went back to their kampong, assuming that her husband, Chinese, was dead. Well, actually, he wasn't. He had been kept in prison, been beaten up all the time, tortured in the lot, and he suddenly arrived at the campong. Hello, wife. We're going back to start up our business. He had been traumatised, and what you saw in the front of the shop all looked good. What was happening behind, the mother was being beaten up, slightest thing wrong. He had been taught that over the last three years. And in the process, they produced another 12 children. The Indians 
Well, of course, the Indian Indian National Army, the INA, which was a pro, well, it was anti anti British, is the way to describe it. There were some, but majority were very much for the Raj, and they were disgusted by the way what they saw, what the Japanese were doing, and one one person i i've met two of the sons all four sons became datuks which are knighted the equivalent of being knighted in this country which is an extraordinary thing for a for a family but their father who worked in a governmental position he carried on during the war working for the government for the japanese and this is in jesselton kota kinabalu at the end of the war there were two indians that thought he was a traitor plus they didn't like him and reported him to the to the british he was then said right you're going to be tried and you're going to be te- deported back to india because we can't have people like you here the chinese all gathered together so by the time he got to labon where the ship had arrived there was a delegation there of chinese and said this man working away in amongst the japanese had saved countless chinese families because he was passing information get out get out get out and they were disappearing off into the jungle and the kempai tai realized where the leak was in the very final days so he was a a japanese actually told him i know what you're doing i'm giving you this what you have been good in giving me milk from your cow or cows escape they're going to come tonight so that is how he was able to escape then gets arrested by the returning brits after the australians and then the brits appear and it was the chinese that gathered together and said no this man has been incredibly brave and you know they all that all been there for for a long time that they had had peace and then the japanese came along and behaved well abominably british prisoners of war start to arrive as well don't they are these coming from singapore i mean there's a tremendous amount captured in singapore the java party if i call them they're actually java number 2 party but in the book i refer to them as java party they all come from java they either royal artillery or raf they go via singapore where they spend about a fortnight three weeks malaya command give them an awful time and told them their dress code was appalling their marching was awful for you're just a mob well you tell mention that to any group of men we're a mob we are the java mob to infuriate malaya command even more who are running the changi POW camps on behalf of the Japanese and they said well you you should go you should be been in java and see how they treat treat them there this is a holiday camp which set them going further then in the beginning of what was beginning of uh, end of september they there they then sail to kuching with russell's party lieutenant colonel russell 30 POWs from the java party are taken as they're in the reaches or kuching river they're then taken off the vessel onto a beach where they're executed massacred nine have already died during the short voyage to kuching my only thinking is that the senior japanese officer etc had decided the these white coolies this 30 are not fit enough they're not going to be any benefit to the glorious japanese army let's get rid of them here they arrive at kuching who should go to batu lintang there's always been this story that the senior officer made the choice in other words lieutenant colonel russell in charge of the java party was squadron leader hardy raf there's a flick of a coin russell said will will flick a coin russell won he knew what batu lintang was because it had been built for the punjab regiment so it was a decent barrack area well i'm going bati lintang little realizing that actually he was condemning the java party apart from those that 30 the two that came were transferred all to death 
The Java party then moved around to Jesselton, which was a 10-day 10, 10 voyage, and they arri arrived there. No more British POWs arrived in British North Borneo. It was purely the Java party, gunners and, and RAF. The Australians had all, already arrived, B Force, prior to them at Sandakan, and then they were topped up with E Force a bit later, a further five, 500. Batu Lintang, they were they were topped up with uh, prisoners uh, being being POWs being brought across, but all came came from Singapore. We all have this idea of what prison camps look like, and then I thought, no, I don't. People don't necessarily have an idea of what prison camps look like because when you think of prison camps, you tend to think of German stalag luft, this, that, and the other in Northwest Europe, and I'm not sure the cultural memory of what a, of 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 those Japanese camps even looks like apart from the bridge over the river Kwai, which doesn't get many repeated very often i guess there was i guess for those old enough there was tenko which might give you some flavor but are facilities prepared for them are they are they uh, ready for the arrival of prisoners of war everyone was slightly different if i say the the idea of like german prisoner of war camps of of high wire and all the rest of it no because the biggest thing was fear. They had no hesitation of killing a prisoner whatsoever. So the fear of escaping, plus you were a white man escaping into an Asian community. However loyal towards you, or anti-Japanese were they, you stood out and invariably you put those families who looked, who looked after and shepherded you in, in serious danger. Jesselton, when they arrived there, the Jess Jesselton POW camp was an acre in, in size. It was actually the jail for the local populace, and it was capable of holding 40 people. And in this acre were, were crammed 836 British POWs. Now, they had put up some huts, but the Atap huts were only... There was enough accommodation for approximately 500. And that is lying like sardines in stilts and they have palm leaves there for the, for the, for the roofs. And it's the standard sort of wooden, wooden building. And so those that couldn't be accommodated would sleep underneath. So it gives them some protection. But once dysentery appeared, those with dysentery had to lie under, not in the Atta, for ob obvious reasons. The other delightful thing about this was the latrines were only dug for 40 prisoners. You've now got 836 using this latrine. And very quickly it filled up, and there was this brown fetid sludge. It was on a slope, and the latrine was at the top. And so it moved down. Hardy and other and the medical officers had had a word and said, look, we need to have the latrines outside here. We can put wire around them. This is unhygienic. Dysentery cases went up to the extent that, I, th I think, that I forget the figure I, I quote, but it was a horrific figure of dysentery cases. The Japanese guards were wearing masks. Only when it went past the guardhouse did they say, oh, you'd better dig a, a DTL there, there? And 51 POWs died during that six-month period they were there. The Japanese, they became concerned about cholera, and we, that's why they were moved to, to Sandakan. At Jefferson, they were working on the, the airfield, and if you land at Kota Kinabalu, that is where the, the POWs, as in Sandakan, had had built the F aerodrome for the, for the Japanese. Interesting side, apart from that, across from it was the Sikh temple. And when they came back from wor working on the aerodrome, the Sikh priest used to play the Shabbat, the, the Sikh holy music on the harmonium. And in there, he would put God Save the King. The British national anthem and the prisoners on here suddenly picking that up would stand to attention facing in all directions 
the Japanese guards looking on and in amazement. It would be a bit like um, mad dogs of Englishmen go out in the midday sun. Now, there is an archway there, and every now and again, a very elderly Sikh would go and stand in there, and when it was played, he would face the POWs and salute. You know, amazingly brave by both, but they, but they survived. And one of the POWs, British officer, painted the water paint, the, the Sikh temple. And I found that in the IWM. And so 51 died, bodies were taken out, and they weren't buried, they were burnt. And the horrific sort of sto- stories there of getting them there. First 200 left for Sandakan, and they were the fittest. And they arrived at their, their new camp, which at uh, Sandakan, which was the Forestry Commission Research Centre. And the photograph which I, I show, and again in, in, in the book, is of ser- a serried lines of ATAP houses, which they had accommodation for everyone. But the day before, the Indonesian Javanese Ramusha and slaves had been occupying, and the place was heaving. Absolutely, it, it was filthy. No lose, no running water, no electricity. So the first 200, when they got there, they had to clean up rapidly. They dug down three wells about 10, 15 feet to get brackish water. They collected water off the Atap houses and then learned that there was a, a bog, a marsh, about 300 yards away, where they collected water as well. However, that is where the Ramusha used to go to bathe and defecate. So that water, which had to be carried, that was all filtered, boiled, and that became drinking water. Then the remainder came, and the 500 odd. They were in appalling state, and the 200 had to go down and carry some of them. They just couldn't, they couldn't walk. But the good side of all that is that top of the hill, it wasn't one acre, it was seven, eight acres. They had space, there was a breeze, and the health of the prisoners went up and the death rate went, went down. And they started going to the aerodrome to work with the Australians, but that was separate. But when the first lot arrived, they came into Sandakan Harbour. They then had to do the walk which is about eight mile, eight kilometres, up to the camp. And as they walked past the Australian camp, there were some Australians that were, that were there. And the, the reports say that they saw them and said, ah, it's the ponds, and realised the condition. And they stood there saluting, where the, the senior British officer said, OK, we, we, we walked to it, marched to attention. And as they, the two Australians and Brits, the Brits marching past, the officers repl- replying the salute and the respect between POWs. But they themselves had realised what an appalling state this lot were. But the ones that came later, about a week, a week later, a fortnight later, were, they were in the worst state going. Are the Allied officers left in place? answerable to the Japanese, are they able to make any complaints that even get listened to? Yeah, yeah there, there is the structure and that, and that was important. The Australians on the whole tried to, when, when they sent B-Force, it, it was structured in such a way that you had infantry, artillery, armour, medics, dentists, etc. Et in a healthy environment, not POWs, this actually was a fighting force. And, you, and they had a lot of officers. Ours wasn't quite the same because it was half RAF and half government. But the senior officer was, was hardy. And then you had the senior army and the, and the senior, senior RAF. They had an adjutant working underneath them. You had to keep the structure. And that, and that was the, very de- definite. And the same in Batu Lintang. Initially, there was a bit of... There were problems in Bilintang, and Lieutenant Colonel Russell stamped on that very firmly indeed. And he got hold of the RSM, I think, in Sutherland, and um, said, right, 
you get your Sergeant Smith sorted out, I have no hesitation in lock, locking ABC these, these people up. If they carry on like that, the only way we're going to survive is that we keep our cohesion. Because we're prisoners of war does not mean we just become a rabble, lose discipline, because then the Japanese will take us apart. So, that, yes, there was. There was that. You always had those that, why should I salute you type of thing. Both um, well, the Australians, the British, um, whichever part they were, they kept, they kept that structure until the end things were beginning to wobble. Could the officers make any effective complaints or recommendations to the Japanese? Or were they just largely ignored? They, they could. They could make complaints. Oh, yes, we'll, we'll do what we can. But you've got to remember, we, we've got to look after ourselves first. And on the whole, the complaints just, by, just bypass. Hardy, for instance, never liked making complaints. One gets these, this not only from gunner officers writing, it was RAF officers as, as well, and, and senior NCOs who, who, who were able to put things in. And never really, want, he felt it, you don't want to upset these people. The same actually occurred with Colonel Walsh, the Australian, in Sandakan, until they were told that they had to, um, to sign a bit of paper to show, say that they would not escape. And Walsh said, no, I'm not signing that. And as they say, they, he had his great moment, because after that, he just sort of seemed to disappear and, for, from sight. And um, they did become the senior officer in ba- Batu Lintang, because he's one of the 40 Australians that were transferred there. People did. Russell was continually going in and, and fighting, fighting his case. And the, the officer that took over from him, because look, Russell tragically died from sepsis, having put a machete into his leg. They did go and complain, but it depended solely on the, on, on the Japanese. For instance, where are Red Cross parcels? We know what come in Red Cross parcels. There's hardly anything in them. At Santa Can, they got one, several had been sent. But they were all they were ra- ra- raided, but they only got one. And then when the Australians they went the um, commandant's house there underneath it was up on stilts were stacked all these red cross passes. And in another place was all this rice because on the first of first of January there was no more re- issue of rice and the bags and bags and bags of it. I was slightly intrigued by the fact that officers sometimes don't always feel the concom. Plane. Does that mean the officers felt as under threat as as the regular prisoners of war that they could be brutally beaten up, you know, harshly treated? Did the is, did the Japanese make a distinction between the officers and men? There were officers that felt that they should not go and do any work. That's what the men are for. And there there are, there, there was one which I quote who. who um, his behaviour in Jesselton was actually appalling. But then when he got to Sandakan, he totally reversed things, which, which was really quite, quite extraordinary. The officers were beaten up for, for, standing, for standing up. One guy was, not, was knocked out. This is, I'm talking now, British POWs, was knocked flying. And the officer there who had led the, the work party stood over him he said, how dare you? And he got, he got absolutely beaten. They suddenly had swarms they loved doing, the Japanese. So they, they, they got beaten up at or aerodrome at Jesselton. An officer there decided to, to lay a guard out. The guard swarmed, dragged him away. And then there was the concern. So another officer went to try and find where, where is Lieutenant so-and-so, went round the building and found him there cross-legged with um, seven or eight Japanese soldiers who had beaten him up, all having a cigarette, roaring with laughter. They said, what's that about? I said, well, they've beaten me up, and now they think it's a good joke. Would I like a cigarette? So I'm having a cigarette. There, there was this sort of contrary type of behaviour. It's quite hard to get your head round how they're starving people, they're withholding treatment, and it's incredibly inconsistent who they... Sp- what they, you know, they suddenly beat people up, don't beat people up. And I can't work out if it's, 
if it's po- if it's some sort of strange policy that you, you can't see or a lack of leadership on their part. It's really odd, uh, the inconsistency of the treatment of the prisoners of war. I mean, g- generally, it's always harsh, but... You know, it's- One goes back, they they love sort of qu- quoting the word Bushido. I read two, two Japanese books, I submit, translated. One was The Bone Man of Kokoda, and it's an extraordinary book, and it, it takes him from being a private recruit, recruit training, to when he was able to get back to Japan. And he fought along the Kokoda Trail, and then he came back as a millionaire, look, looking for the bones of his of his mates, hence the, the name. But how slapping started right at recruit training. You, you slapped your best friend, and that became, it was, they were indoctrinated into this, into this behavior. I think it was Slim who said the Jap- Japanese, was the word he, that's it. They're a locust army. As they move forward, they eat everything. But what they forget about is that once there is nothing else to eat, there's nothing coming up behind them. So their logistics were absolutely appalling. Their administration was appalling as well. And so in Borneo, there was so much that they could have, especially in Kalamant or Dutch Borneo, because the Indonesian did not like the Dutch colonists at all. The way, the way they, they behaved was appalling to, to, towards the locals. They were rounding them up, executing ma- massacres. They were doing that in British Borneo as well, where they could have quite easily have changed things around. And in the early days, they said, right, cut down all these robber trees. We want to grow rice. You can't grow rice there. It doesn't work. Cut them down. So they were cut. all right. If that's what you want, so rubber trees were cut down. Why is the rice growing? Because you cut down the rubber. This ground is not good, and vice versa. We want to grow rice here. It won't work. Why? Because it's a mangrove area, and so it went on. And it, yeah, it. Their administration was um, was shocking, and one talks about that at Mandor between 2,000 and 20,000 Kalamantes, locals from Dutch Borneo, were, were massacred. Yet what surprised me is the Chinese do actually have a guerrilla movement. It's a, it's a Chinese organised guerrilla movement that does rebel. It's in the British North Borneo, isn't it? That was the double tent uprising led by Albert Kwok. He actually came from Kuching. Colourful character, to say the least. He was able to gear people up. And the idea was to throw throw the Japanese out. out. He met up with um, Agus, part of Z Force. They said, "Yes, we will get you weapons, but you must not do anything until we get you the weapons, and you have proper training." Quark's idea of uh, security was lousy. They had no idea. They used to go to the same, let's call it a coffee bar or something like that. And they would sit there and discuss, thinking that the Japanese couldn't, wouldn't be able to understand what they were saying. Well, the Japanese were aware, but they couldn't believe. They thought this was a, some form of joke or feint. And then the double tenth, he said, right, the, this is when we're going to do, go for it, the 10th of October. And they killed a lot, quite a few Japanese and women and children. He had been told uh, we should not do the women and children. So they're all Japanese. Parangs, homemade rifles, shotguns. They didn't have the weapons. He went too early. And the Japanese, they ran into secure shelters. It went on for a few days. And then they, they flew soldiers in from Kuching. And they went on the rampage throughout British North Borneo. They estimate about 5,000 were killed. And out in the, the islands now known as the Tunku Adbid or Raman Islands, there's one where they killed all the men, or should I say all the males, apart from one who's a nine, eight-year-old. And so they, to the women, said, there you are. He, he can be the, um, the saviour of your, your people on this, on this island. One has spoken to people that, in fact, about Datuk Irene Cherub, she was head of uh, Sabotourism Board. I met her father, and he was a 16-year-old, and he was 
absolute delight. He had been sent to Singapore to be educated. His father then sent him money and said, pay off your fees, get back, the Japanese are coming. He turned around to his tutor, I've, I've got to go. With part of the money, he bought a gramophone player, which was part of his story. And he said, yes, you must, because when you first see a Japanese soldier, you will urinate. And he said, I did in Jesselton, and I urinated. He said, they were scary. He was a cyclist. Japanese love cycling. He used to go on cycle rides with them and show them all the different sorts of ways. But he was also delivering food to Albert Kwok. I said, that is brave. And he said, not really. Is it brave? I said, if they had caught you, you wouldn't be telling me this story. And I said, sir, that, that is brave. And the record player, Albert Kwok, came to their house one day and he said, oh, I've got two records, I must borrow that. And so off we went with my record player. I never saw it again. And one day he, he said, I did do my bit. I said, you, you, you did, and just dropping off food. And uh, this warrant officer or Japanese guy said, I want a, a good hard race up into the hills towards Mount Kinabalu. Yes, that would be good. He said, OK, fine. And he said, the one thing you never won, you always came third or fourth. You always let the Japanese <laughs> win. So off they went. And then down they came. And he said, some of them, the, the less experienced, we got down to the bottom and we were waiting. We were waiting. And he said, oh, they got lost. Forget them. They didn't get lost and said they were never found again. So I did my bit. They either went off the edge or there were some locals there to take, take, take them out. In total, in, Brit in British North Borneo, 19% of the Sabahan population died at the, basically at the hands. 19%, 49,000. It, it is a horrific figure. So you, you mentioned that the Allies were going to supply weapons to the guerrillas. Were the Allies inserting teams onto the island then? What, what, what were they aiming to do? Yes, it was known overall as Z-Force, and they, they belonged to an organisation, SRD, Services Reconnaissance Department. In essence, they worked out of Perth. And there's one group, the Agus Group, and they were their leader was Gort Chester, very brave man. He was a plantation manager. He had fought during the First World War. He knew a lot of locals. He spoke various languages or dialects. So he, he was chosen to become the leader of Agus, which, is, if I remember, is the word Malay for ant, ant or mosquito. And he had a small team. And initially, they were there to, to land, to recce, to report and also report on Sandakan, on, on the um, prisoner of war camp. His, his blokes were, all, um, were all, all Australian. He asked for them to be properly trained, which the majority were not, unfortunately. And then when he sent reports back, if he said, I, I'd like supplies of £2,000 worth of supplies, they'd send 10000 now, these are figures I'm just pulling out of the head. And he'd go back at them and say, I don't want that amount. What am I going to do with that? It's all wasted. And he, he lost a couple of people. They then came back again. They set up hospitals. They built up a fighting force. And I think possibly the greatest thing that, that they did, that before the Allied invasions of the Obo operations, which occurred at Labon and Brunei Bay, he got the message to, to the towns, the cities, like Chesterton, to the people, pull back, go into the jungle. And the Japanese, when they saw this business occurring down in Chesterton and all that, they thought, they're going to land here. Well, one could say that was a feint, but Chesterton was flattened, Sandakan was flattened, all these towns, Tawa, etc., by, by bombing by naval gu gu gunfire. And of course, uh, Obo 6 occurred up in, La up in Labon. 
Unfortunately, Gorchester, he died from Blackwater fe- fever at the end of the war. And he's buried in Cota Kinabalu because one of the Australian operatives said if he had lived, he was going to blow the lid of the appalling administration, etc. But they did a grand job. They did a good job. Then there was Senate, which was operated at the eastern end of Sarawak and the sort of the western edge of uh, British North Borneo. The leader was meant to have been Toby Carter, a New Zealander. He was a tall, quietly spoken man, brave. But there's a character by the name of Tom Harrison, who was a polymath, he had three or four hard discs whirring around in his, in his head. He had led expeditions into Borneo. He could speak, speak the dialects. He knew it. He was, a, well, said, I'm, I'm the leader. And Toby said, I'll get on with it. And he's also known as the rudest man alive. And when, the, when they landed up in, the, up in the highlands, he said, right, this is what we're going to do. Get rid of your boots. Get rid of your clothes. You're, you're wearing sarongs. You're, we're going to eat local food. However, medics, your job is to go around all the campongs in the area and to see that the locals are all right, sort out any problems. We win their minds. minds. He built up a force. They trained guerrillas. As they were in four different groups, there was Sochon, he was a Canadian, and Jenkins, who was an, uh, he was Australian. Bill Sochon was Canadian. They're all part of the Senate group. They train people up and they're uh, accredited with killing about up to 1,500 Japanese because they've built up this guerrilla force. When the Australians landed, they didn't like these, these people who came out of the trees and said this and this. We have our intelligence. Your intelligence is rubbish. I'm telling you this. And it was only after a while they suddenly realized when here was the disconnect, listen to Agus listen to Semit. Did they suddenly realize that these people were, they'd been living out there, they knew the countryside and, and, and the lot. There's an amusing story when with the, one of the Semit lot came down and said, well, oh yes, there are a lot of Japanese there. We've sorted them out. What do you mean you sorted them out? Well, so I'll go and, I'll go and collect, I'll show you. And so off we went and came back with several heads. Headhunting became a thing. John, we're going to pause it there. Folks, we'll be back in a moment. Welcome back. I'm joined by John Tullock and we're discussing Borneo in World War II. As the war's closing in on the Japanese on the island, presumably they get increasingly isolated. How does that affect the prisoners of war? Well, towards the end of '44, we get the, the situation of rice rations now way down. And the 1st of January, they're they're just cut. But the POWs, as well did the internees, they had been collecting rice and hiding it from the Japanese who were continually searching and trying to find anything that was being stored. And so that is what they were. And at Sandakan, by this stage, there was no working on the the airfields, uh, on the airfield, should I say, because it had been bombed out. Prisoners had been, POWs had been killed there by bombing. They weren't allowed to use any of the slit trenches to hide in. That was for the Japanese, not for the, the prisoners to escape the bombing raid. And then, of course, we had the three death marches. So they decide to empty the camps, don't they? Yeah, this is Sandakan, and it's the death march. They march them from Sandakan to Ranau, which is 165 miles. The initial part, which is now oil palm plantations, but then was boggy, marshy land. The locals, local headmen, had been told to cut a route for the Japanese to travel to Rano. So they got together, this is how we'll cut it. Well, if you're going to cut it for the, for the enemy, then you make it as difficult as possible. So let's go across the bogs. Every now and again, they are they would built the walkways out of bamboo, which isn't cut to the feet. And then it starts climbing. As we know, you never go over a hill to get to the other side. You contour around. But no, this was over the hill. And 
you cross the river at the most convenient place. No, you cross the river at the most inconvenient. And they crossed, yes, rivers and streams, something like 33 times. Now, when you think about that, with bare feet, loincloths, and their carrying gear, um, got malaria, dysentery, very, very, all, all the, the horrors of, of disease, and starved. The first group, they were given four days' worth of rations. The day before, they'd been given 70, 70 grams just for them to give them energy. And they set, set off on the 28th of January, 455 of them, in nine groups, Australian and British. And they were the fittest, following behind them with a killing squad. And if you dropped out, basically you were executed, and by various means chopping, bare knitting, sometimes shot, but that's a waste of a round, a strangle, you, you name it. When they arrived, 309 arrived at, at Ranau, 29% had perished on the route. Then there's the second march, and that was 536. Now, this was the march that re- really sort of, it was a march of death, and 66% died on that. Two Australians successfully escaped. There were British, there were Australian and British POWs who tried, but were unsuccessful. At Tankle Crossing, 33 POWs were, were massacred. At Paganantan, Tempai Kai came up, grabbed a prisoner, which was fleshy, killed him on the spot, chopped him up, butchered him is the only way to describe it, because it was fresh meat. Simple, simple as that. They practiced cannibalism, and not just on the POWs. This was occurring in the interior. And some of the Formosan guides were taking strips off legs or thighs to give taste to the, the food they were eating. By the time they got to Rano, were hoping to see all their mates. They were greeted by six POWs from the, from the first group. And the words were, where, where are they? They are exterminating us. Those were the words. How do we know those? Because four prisoners, Australians, escaped just before the, the, the end of the war or just before the executions of the last POWs. And they, they survived and were able to record those, those, those words. And the final march was on the 15th of June of 75 prisoners, majority were British, and they didn't make the 30, 30 mile distance. That's a 100% death. That, that was a march to death, leaving 213. The day after, on the 19th of June, they burnt down all the accommodation, the Atap huts, and said, we're, going, we're getting rid of the fleas and all the rest of it. We'll build you nice ones, which never were. And these guys, well, they, they all died, including one case of a cru- crucifixion of a gunner officer. At Ranau, it was a death camp of the, and, and absolutely appalling. I've been down there several times. And the last time I went, actually, I spooked my guides because part of my military training in the jungle is the business of the use of sound and sound travels and that. And I thought, maybe I can get an echo here. And I found the spot, did several cooies, Australasian, Anzac, cry. And one got the cooie coming back. And they were looking at me. And then I shouted, you're, you're going home. And this echo came going, going home, going, going home. And my hackles went up. The guys looked at me and said, Saab, I think, Major John, I think we should be um, leaving now. And I said, yes, I think so. Hopefully something that will have done something. But on the 27th of August, 12 days after the end of the war, the last 15 that ran out were, ex- were executed, five officers, 10 other ranks, Australian and British. And on the 15th of August at Sandakan, the last POW was, was executed in Australian. And once that occurred, the, the Japanese then started walking the route to Jesselton for the defence of as they considered Borneo. It's amazing they're carrying on 
right up to the end of that ill treatment, you'd have thought they might want to uh, change the conditions a bit to... Uh... Surrender wasn't in part, part of their, their thing. And of course, the great thing was of their ideology had that message got through to them. But of course, at Batu Lintang, on the 15th of August, 45, there, Colonel Sugar had written out this thing, what was going to happen to the prisoners. They were all going to be killed, POW and internees. And for some unknown reason, he changed that to the 14th or 15th of September. And we know that because when Brigadier Estick and K-Force arrived on the 11th of September and took the surrender of Sugar in searching his, his office, his headquarters, they, they found in his office a sheet of paper dealing, this is now what is going to happen. And we get the sort of words, dispose of all prisoners, 15th of September, Group 1, internee women, children, nuns given poisoned rice. Group 2, internee men and Catholic fathers to be shot and burnt. Group 3, 500 POWs to be marched to the mountains then shot in the jungle, burnt and buried in pits. Group four, the second week, left at Batu Lintang to be burned to death, the entire Batu Lintang camp to be destroyed by fire. So K-Force arrived just in time. When I first sort of read, read, read that, I had not seen the Japanese paper with it written. I can only take that that is, as being right because of, of all the reports. I met a retired general who had been 11-year-old in the Philippines when he was as as an internee. And when he read my second article in the Royal Artillery Journal, he, he he said to me, absolutely right. The Americans arrived the day before. If they'd arrived the day after, I wouldn't be speaking to you now because they found the order to get rid of everyone in that particular camp. So it must have been, you know, a pretty global thing because on the 1st of January, they they did that, what's it, kill the prisoners. And that started the, the rice business. Japanese high command military policy issued on 1st January 45, whether they're destroyed individually or in groups or how it is done with mass bombing, poisonous smoke, poisons, drowning, decapitations, or what dispose of the prisoners as the situation dictates. I was going to say, what for the the prisoners? Those prisoners have been nearly in captivity for three three years. So for them, what does the end of the war mean? I mean, what kind of state are they in? How long does it take them to get fit again? Because they have, they're, well, they've been staffed for more or less three years. And those that survived presumably have probably had half a dozen various illnesses from the camps? They were suffering from all sorts. When we can sort of forget, not forget Sandakan, we can forget about Sandakan because there were no, there was no one there alive. It's all to do with Batu Lintang. When the Australians arrived, obviously they were appalled. And funny enough, it was the Indian soldiers that provided the guard of honour. They were given a shocking time. The Australians put in, in an extraordinary, extraordinary business of right. The medics came in and is the word triaging them, you're serious, you're very serious, you're immediate serious type type of thing. The local hospital, they went, the very bad ones went into there. They had the the hospital ship, the Wangala. They had destroyers, both Australian and, and American, the Catalinas, the Dakotas, flying them to Lab 1 which, of course, they had secured with Obo 6 when they la- landed there, and they'd set up, set up hospitals. They were flown all by ship. They arrived, and the Australian medical situation was was quite extraordinary. And the, the diaries and letters I bred uh, just can't praise them enough. One, one person wrote that, that first night I had one, two... Certainly three gin and tonics, but I'm not sure how many more. It was great. Another rose and said, the real highlight was sitting on the beach, having a, having a tea party with my friends and being, being treated. They could only be given so much food because they're, 
stomachs had shrunk and all the rest, rest of it. And it was good Australian tucker. There's no two ways about it. But then repatriation started. And almost to a man and a woman, they all wrote the difference of going from the Australian way of treat- treatment to the British way of treatment was enormous. Suddenly, it was very regimental, etc. At this stage, there had been at least six weeks bronzing up in the sun. They'd been eating foods that they'd been putting on the pounds. And physically, you couldn't, you couldn't see the difference. And if I can read here, this is Harry Howarth, the FIPO. We had come home and we felt as if we didn't belong. The only people who understood us were ourselves. And over the years, this would become more and more true. And then an internee, SRN Hilda Bates, internee Bartu Lintang, we were learning to mix with people again. We are all nervous about getting home and meeting our people. There is a great bond between us, the Barbois friends. They return to an echo chamber of utter silence. And so when they got got home to the UK, people were saying to them on, on the train, what did you do during the war? And said, oh, I was a PAW in Southeast Asia. Well, you've had a grand time, haven't you? Look at you, you're bronze, you're well, no, no concept, and no idea. And the other, and that is actually a copy of it, which I showed in the book, The Order of Silence, Do Not Talk, about it, etc. And then the interrogation. So that order of silence was given by the government issued to surviving prisoners to not speak about don't, their... Don't, uh, don't talk about it to your families, to your friends, definitely not to the press. If someone asks you, How's, how is I, Tommy Smith, D- don't, don't, say, don't say anything. My uncle, my mother's brother, he was a POW, he was on the railway and at Changi. And when he came back, the only person he spoke to, and that was once, was his mother, my grandmother. He would not talk about it at all. The silence, they were suffering. And the government were doing basically nothing towards it. The Roehampton Hospital set its up, itself up as the FIPO Hospital. And then it was made into an NHS hospital. And thankfully... The LSTM, the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, took over that role as being the focus point. And their, is it psychiatrists or psychologists? I met him at one of the conferences up in Liverpool, but he, he did a study and the, the percent, it's something like 40 odd percent of the prisoners were all suffering. They, they, they suffered. There was nothing there. Now, General Percival, and he he was reviled because he surrendered Singapore, which in fact, though he signed the document, it was his generals that hung him out to dry and saying that their men couldn't fight anymore and, and what have you. So he felt he had, had little choice. But when he retired, he saw what was happening and he put up a case, I need money to set up support for the FIPOs and I would assume internees. And he won reparations from the Japanese, five million pounds. Now that is back in in the late 1940s. That is an extraordinary sum. That's 200, I think, I think I worked it out, 250 odd plus million. People sort of quietly forget about that. They they curse him for what he did, but little realizing that uh, what he did after the war was was really quite extraordinary. But yeah, they, they came back to a very, very hard time. One case I report, he arrives, I think it was O'Reilly, and he bashes on the door, who's that? It's me. What do you mean it's you? And he comes down, oh, it's you. Can you pay? I don't have any money. Can you pay the, the taxi driver? Well, I, you've got money. Look at you. And he goes searching his backpack or his rucksack seeing if he had any had any money. That was his greeting. And the taxi driver said, don't worry, enjoy home. What's the government's justification for this order of silence? It's such an odd thing to do. Yeah, I think it was the protection of people. I think the government wanted to move on. In German POW camps, 
4% died. The number that died on the Burma Rail, Railway, this is POWs, and I'm not talking about locals, was 20%. In British North Borneo, it was 99.75%. And in Batu Lingtang, it was over 50%. But hey, who knows about the POW camps in Borneo? General public don't. And they were concerned, I'm sure, that if this sort of information, media getting hold of it, blowing it up, it was not in the best interest of the government moving moving forward, quietly forgetting that the best way for people to get things out is to the business of, 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 of talking. And they knew what had happened. They knew what had happened about the death marches. There was a, a Colonel MP from Plymouth Way where he raises it in Parliament. What about our POWs in um, Borneo? And the reply was, "Oh, we're still trying, trying, trying to find the right the, the numbers that that have survived there. We're, we're still looking." They knew. I say that because reading the the Australian Army newspaper. That would come out. Platypus. It has has it the can. It doesn't mention it doesn't mention Jesselton because no Australians were there, but but Sander can. Vatu Lintang mentions the death marches. It's all there in public domain. They knew, but they wanted to just park it. The war had been over in Europe. The the people, the British people. The war is over. And I guess it takes them five, six months to arrive back, so there would be a quite a long feeling of the war being over by the time they've recuperated and been shipped back around halfway around the world. Indeed. Some came by ship, others went sort of westwards, others were sent eastwards to Vancouver and then put on, on, on a train across Canada and then shipped across. Some of them thought that was a deliberate ploy where there used to be the fanfare of welcoming him back was barely anything at all. And one other mentioned, he, he said, the interrogation, the guy asked, well, were there any sort of turncoats or people that co- colluded with the Japanese? And he said, well, I can tell you about the officers, where the chap said, I, I didn't ask you that. And he said, well, and I'm not going to give you anything more. Thank you very much. And you can't do that. Yes, I can. I'm going. And so off, off he went. It was badly done. But the Australians, it was kept very quiet. And the six, well, the six SKPs, one of them died in a traffic accident, hit and run in, in, in Melbourne. And another one wouldn't speak. But the other, other four started talking about it in late, late 1980s of what happened in Sandakan and the death marches. And it came out, but that that was that was being pushed down. And when the first report, when the the British and Australian burial units were going going round, picking up the detritus. And the report there, the officer in in command of it, the Australian, his report was thrown out initially. And then it was just quietly stowed. I, I've got a black copy. So I've been able, so I've been able to refer to it uh, in, in in places. Were many Japanese tried after the war for their uh, treatment to the prisoners in Borneo? There there were a few. the The trouble is that a lot sort of disappeared out of sight, and then you've got the they they had their own death march in 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 British North Borneo, where between six and eight thousand Japanese died, and they walked along generally the the same track the locals took their chance to to repay whether it was blowpipe or bayonet machete poisoning them i've been to two villages campons where they took one this group a company came in about 200 men starving gave them tapioca raw tapioca and they wish they chomped with delight and said no you'll need to drink a lot of water which they did and then they just sat around and watched them the stomachs exploding so they died an appalling death and another they gave them some form of let's say herbal tea which made them go to sleep and then they practice their head hunting on 
sleeping Japanese. They lost a lot. There would have been people in amongst that. That's why I men- mentioned. Yes, there were Japanese that were tried. Some were shot, some were hung. And it was the Australians on the whole that, 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 that carried out the trials. But what is interesting, before judgment was passed, it would go to the judge in Melbourne. And some of them would look, well, the, this statement, there's a judicial term, not fragile, but this statement by this ex-prisoner prisoner of war is weak, is not strong enough. If he can't tell the time, tell the time of day on the exact day this atrocity occurred. It, well, and again, I know, you know, you go on exercise, even a, a five-day exercise where you spend most of your time awake, you can you can l- lose what, what what time is this? Is this Thursday or Friday or whatever it is? They've been in there years. How are they going to know? And so some of it was turned back and said, no, this is not execution, etc. But what I think is the appalling thing is the, the Vancouver Treaty, when the prison, those that were in jail then went back to Japan, to a main jail in Tokyo, where they were held there, where they were meant to carry out their full term of imprisonment. And shortly after the Vancouver Treaty, then they they started pardoning people. And when the last one left, none of them completed their full term. The bulldozers came in and destroyed the prison. I I never knew that until I sort of researched it. That, that, that That was the end of that. Sugar, the commandant, he escaped by committing Harry Carey. I forget whether it was a broken bottle or something, but that's where he was taken to lab on and did himself in. Another one bit the hung, the hangman before he met his end. But I think people thought at the time that an awful lot more should have been executed for what they'd done. Yes, indeed. Now, John, your book is possibly one of the most compelling books I've read. Um, the more, the more, the more I got into it, the more I was absolutely compelled. It's just quite an incredible, and it's there's a there's a it's a it's a big book. Now, if people listening would like a copy, because it's not for sale on Amazon, how can they find a copy? Yeah, if they, um, yeah, if they it, it, on this email, John S M Tullock at gmail dot com. And you do personally uh, inscribe everyone, don't you? Yes, I do. And if someone contacts me, I will always give them, send them the um, a book flyer. The weight of the book is one point five kilograms. In the book flyer, it says four seventy two pages. It's actually four hundred ninety two pages. It has map, it has photographs, and it's what I call a proper book, hardcover, not soft cover. It's beautifully put together. And I do say, if you want me to to sign, date, use my words, we must keep the flame of history and remembrance burning. And if they want anything to do with their, with their relative dedication in memory of, I will do, I will check that name against my, the data I've got, and the backwards and, 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 and forwards, and once they've done that, um, I say, right, I will send you my my ba- bank details for ba- back strong transfer, and I'll, I'll I will then post. So that is John S M Tulloch at gmail dot com. That's T U L L O C H. I will put a link on the website and in the show notes. John, thank you for your time, folks. As I said. Born Your Graveyard. Folks, as I said, Born Your Graveyard is remarkably compelling once you get started. So again, if you want your copy, it's John S M Tulloch at gmail.com. T-U-L-L-O-C-H. Now, as a fan of the World War II podcast, I'm sure you want to enhance your listening experience. So why not consider becoming a patron by joining the Patreon community at patreon.com slash WW2podcast. You can enjoy ad-free episodes, allowing you to immerse yourself in each episode. But that's not all. Fans also get exclusive access to extra unreleased content. These bonus bits delve deeper into the topics covered. 
Your support on Patreon helps me keep the podcast running and growing and enabling me to bring you even more high quality content without interruptions. So if you're ready for an ad free, richer experience, visit patreon.com slash WW2 podcast. Well, that is all for this episode. Next time, I'm hoping we'll be discussing photo reconnaissance. So until then, I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening. Jerry, 88 millimeter gun hit our tongue and blew us the hell out of it. The hell out of it. The hell out of it. Stalingrad can never be repaired. Be repaired. As Allied Commander in Chief, I have granted a military armistice.